With respect to uh, let's uh, just say hypo hypothetically, though, uh, hypothetically, and I, I know I'm going to get. I, I know all the usual caveats, right, and right. I accept them. Oh, thank you, Mr. Yes, Waxman. Yes, I'm, I'm pretty thank sure you. since you're asking me, I'm not going to like. You're not going to like. It. <laughs> but let's assume that a very wealthy university could pay for everybody to go, and still increase its endowment. It's a perpetual motion machine, Malcolm Gladwell called them. <laughs> Let's say it, 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 if it just gave up preferences for donors' children, legacies, and squash athletes, okay? Or maybe those who row crew, all of which tend to favor predominantly white children. And it could achieve whatever it deemed racial diversity. Would it then be permitted to engage in race consciousness, or in that circumstance, would you agree that uh, that would not be narrowly tailored? So I'm not claiming. I'm accepting your hypothetical as hard as it is for me in light of what the evidence I understand is, shows. There we go. I, I am not claiming that there is a compelling interest in having donors per se. There is a compelling interest in your proverbial art museum. There is a compelling There is a compelling interest in the art museum? No, no. no. This, these are the things that I'm not okay, claiming. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm just sorry. claiming all of those things. All right. When you look at a so-called race-neutral alternative, the question that this court, that Justice Powell articulated in Bakke and this court underscored and amplified in Grutter and then in Fisher is how does, is, does that race neutral alternative actually substantially impact the character of the institution and the education oh. that's being provided? Now, let and me stop here, you there because, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but surely getting rid of those preferences would substantially impact the university. And, but and you, you are, you're, you're saying they are not a compelling interest for constitutional purposes. So, no, what, I'm, what I'm saying— Or does the 14th Amendment make, make legacy children— Of don't, course— Okay, no. So of, we agree. Of course not. And the truth of the matter is that if this were a case in which the evidence showed that eliminating a legacy preference made a substantial difference, the district judge who— to say that the district judge was applying strict skeptical scrutiny on the narrow tailoring principles is quite an understatement. Okay. Might have decided otherwise. What the district court found, and uh, Judge oh, okay, Gorsuch, okay. if I can just sure. make one comment about the record, which I think responds to the, at least the gist and spirit of your hypothetical. With respect to race-neutral alternatives, the, the, the simulation, what has come to be called simulation D in this court, the district court found that, quote, the simulation D would require, quote, sacrifices on almost every, every dimension important to Harvard's admissions process. Among other things, and these are all recited in the Smith Committee report, they are recited in the, the extensive discussion of race-neutral alternatives in both the district court opinion and the court of appeals opinion, are that, for example, with respect to academic excellence, the academic factor, the number of, of matriculants with, who score one or two on the five-point scale would go down 17 percent. I'm familiar. There, Mr. Waxman, I am yeah. familiar with all that along so in with it. We go down not, from 99 to 98th percentile. I, I've got it. If I, no, might, no. if I might shift gears. Okay. I, I, I'm familiar with all those, and I appreciate that, and I understand your point. It was a hypothetical. Um, what do we do about history here? Because one, one, of, one, one thing we, we know, or we think we know, or we're told in the briefs at least, is that Harvard's move to a holistic uh, application approach happened in the 1920s because it wanted to impose a quota on Jewish applicants, but it didn't want to do through front door. So it used diversity as a as, as subterfuge for racial quotas. What the record in this case shows, and it's, it's discussed in some detail in the, I'm going to blank on the names of the reports, but the various reports that Harvard has done over the years on diversity and diverse admissions in the case, one is the so-called Rudenstein report and the other is the Corona report, both of which are in the joint appendix, is that Harvard actually, even before the Civil War, has at its admissions policy 
an effort to, in fact, diversify on both viewpoint and geography the class. Now, it is no, there's no doubt, and Harvard acknowledges and is ashamed that in 1920, one of its presidents, President Lowell, decided that there were too many Jews and that they were then going to start asking questions on the application that would allow them to take into effect character. The notion that that bears at all on the way that Harvard's current admissions process, which uses a 40-person admissions committee that meets and decides each application on banc in discussion, has any resemblance whatsoever to the racist, anti-Semitic policy of a single Harvard president is insubstantial, as the courts found. Okay, how do you respond then to, uh, again, we have many briefs on this point from Asian American applicants um, who have, um, and, and it, it, they say there's an entire industry to help them appear less Asian on their college applications, and that they consider elite colleges to have Asian quotas effectively, if not in name? I'll say two things. One, generally about the amicus briefs, and two, specifically about Harvard. And I, I certainly want to get to number two. But there are multiple amicus briefs filed by Asian American organizations, and one that is particularly, I think, powerful, filed by 1,240 scholars of Asian American experience and Asian ethnicity, all of whom not only opine but cite studies showing that Asian Americans as a group, and Asia of course represents 61% of the world's population and a multiplicity of ethnicities, that Asian Americans benef demonstrably benefit from hol a holistic admissions policy that considers race as one factor among many. Now, with respect to Harvard, there was, to say that there was evidence in this case is quite an understatement. The district court found, I'm citing, I'm quoting page 261 of the joint appendix, and it's reiterated by the Court of Appeals on page 80 of the joint appendix, that there was, quote, no evidence of discrimination against Asian Americans whatsoever. Again, now on page 264, there was consistent, unambiguous, and convincing testimony that there was no discrimination in the administration pro administrative admissions process in general and the personal rating in particular. The, the plaintiffs in this case could not, after four years of discovery, in which they hand-picked applications to view in total. They could not produce a single witness to testify that he or she had been discriminated well, against. Justice Gorsuch? Um, just to return to Justice Sotomayor's question to you, um, you indicated, I believe, that, that, that um, the percentages have varied dramatically over the years. Um, I must be missing something. Of, on page 23 of the petitioner's brief, they have the statistics from Harvard from 2006 through 2018 and, and, and the share of um, Asian American students um, varied three, three, between 17 and 20 percent every year, 70 percent actually being the outlier. Am I missing something? No, Justice Gorsuch, I think that the point I was trying to make is that that band is actually a greater amount of fluctuation than was present in the applicant pool with respect to the number of Asian Americans who were applying to Harvard every year. But, but let me is just say this. Is the same thing true with the Hispanics and, and African Americans? Because the numbers are pretty similar similarly banded for those. Yes, that's my understanding, that the district court's factual finding in this regard is that there was relative stability with respect to the number of individuals in those groups who were applying and greater fluctuation with respect to admissions decisions. No, these, 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 are, these, these are admitted students I'm talking about here. Yes, and the district court was drawing a comparison between the, the uh, bands that you were just describing and the bands that exist the with The point is, whatever the pool is, every year the percentage is the same. And the U.S. government below said this manifest steadiness speaks for itself. 
Am I missing something? Well, let me just say that the district court made a factual finding of no racial balancing. But if you think the district court was wrong about that, <laughs> and this is clearly erroneous, then that is clearly impermissible, and, and the court should send it back. That would provide a basis to reverse on clear error, and we are not here to suggest that racial balancing is okay under this court's precedence. Grutter doesn't countenance it, and the court could make that clear. A follow up on uh, Justice Thomas's questions about diversity. Um, Again, these holistic admissions approaches seem to stem from the 1920s at Harvard, and uh, they were used as cover for quotas uh, for Jewish persons who uh, the university apparently felt had too many students attending. And I, I guess I'm struggling still to understand how you distinguish between what this court has said is impermissible, a quota, with what you argue should be permissible going forward, which is diversity. How can you do diversity without taking account of numbers? So I think there's, there's two separate points I'd like to make on that, Your Honor. So on the, uh, the sordid history uh, of the early holistic process, uh, I don't think anyone has ever uh, accused the University of North Carolina as having- I'm not suggesting that. Yeah, yeah and, and we, uh, we took our cues from this court, from the Bakke decision and, and from- uh, Oh, the I decision. understand and that too. But I guess my question again, just to get to the core of it rather than circling around it, is how can you do diversity, which that's what you're arguing for, without taking account of numbers? Our interest in what we uh, believe that Grutter requires is of us is individualized, holistic review. And I think there's actually been a lot of misconception. But if I you don't achieve, the, you have to achieve diversity, though. That's the goal. So how do you do that? Again, uh, last time I'll ask it yep. without looking at numbers. We do so by looking at the individual applicant. Uh, we do not uh, have some sort of racial target uh, or a, a target for other diver diversity metrics, for example. We don't say we want to have 10% of our class be military veterans. We say we value this diversity interest and we're going to look at each individual applicant on, on that basis. Justice Gorsuch? Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to focus for a moment on, on the statutory questions, one I raised earlier. I'd like your thoughts on it. Uh, we have both a constitutional claim but also a statutory claim, Title VI. And I understand our precedents have often conflated the two. But put that aside for the moment. Um, Justice Stevens made a powerful argument in Bakke that whatever the 14th Amendment permits or does not permit, Title VI's language is plain and clear, just as Title VII is. And Title VII does not permit discrimination on the basis of sex, and Title VI does not permit discrimination on the basis of race. Can you help me with that? Sure, Justice Gorsuch. So I think that the court in Bakke and Grutter correctly interpreted Title VI. The statute where, where, is— Where did Justice Stevens err? In rec not recognizing that the term discrimination in this context is ambiguous. And I think that the legislative history, therefore, carries force in this it, context. We didn't find it ambiguous in Bostock. Why should we find it ambiguous now? Well, I think that I, I think that the statute Were doesn't we wrong define. In Bostock? The, no, I'm not suggesting that. But Justice Gorsuch, I know you asked me to put to the side that the court has already resolved this issue. Uh, I just would emphasize All right, you're that go back to that. we're okay. talking about a statute here. Statutory stare decisis considerations have their greatest force. Congress has never overturned this court's interpretation of Title VI. Petitioners aren't asking this court to revisit its interpretation of Title VI. On the text, though, do you have anything else? I would point to the ambiguity in the term discrimination. Okay. But it's not ambiguous in Title VII. No, and, and we respect this court's decision in Boston. It's just ambiguous in Title VI, the same word. This court has held that multiple times. Okay. What do we say to Asian Americans who there's a veritable cottage industry, we're told by the briefs, that they are uh, encouraging Asian applicants uh, to avoid and beat, quote, Asian quotas. That's how they perceive it. Is that an important consideration and that they tell applicants, coaches tell applicants to disguise their backgrounds and their names to the extent possible in order to secure what they view as an even footing in the admissions process? I find uh, those accounts appalling. They are not permitted under the Constitution. It's very clear that racial identity cannot be treated as a negative. That would be intentional discrimination. It's prohibited under equal protection. It's prohibited under Title VI, and Grutter does not countenance it. So to the extent uh, that that is happening at any educational institution around this country, it's unlawful, and should, the university should be held accountable for it. 